you can all breathe easy. I'm not your speaker, but I'm here to introduce our, our speaker. As uh, you may have gathered, we have enjoyed a conference this past Friday and Saturday. Uh, it was a wonderful windfall of biblical uh, wisdom. And I encourage you, as we make that available, to seek that out if you were unable to attend and to uh, buy that free wisdom and not sell it. Uh, that said, uh, Pastor David Shiflett, I met in Houston while I was there uh, for a couple years, and I had the pleasure and joy to take my family there and worship uh, the duration for almost two years, and it was a great benefit to me. And so I consider him and Gina great friends, and because they are great friends of mine, they most certainly are great friends of yours. Uh, David is a godly, faithful man who loves the church and loves to make God's word known to his people for their sanctification. Uh, he knows God because God has made him known to him. And he's the kind of man that I want to hear because I want to know God also. And so it is with that uh, I welcome Pastor David to bring the word to us this morning. Bible Church, they often spoke of you uh, kindly and affectionately and looking forward to being back with their church home, but we were, we were privileged to get to know them and, and, and in some sense get to know you through them. So when the invitation came for me to come and uh, speak and preach to you in the context of a conference, uh, I, it was not just the weather that made me jump on that opportunity. I genuinely wanted to be with you, uh, to be with Richard and, and Cindy and the entire Anderson clan has been a, a joy for us. I want to pray and ask for the Lord to help us as we give our attention now to this solemn and also joyful opportunity to come into the very presence of Christ. We believe that Christ exercises the office of mediator. He is the one mediator between God and man, and he exercises that office of mediator in three ways, as prophet, priest, and king. And as he comes, and as we open the word of God today, you will know, as Paul testified to the, to the Thessalonian church, in fact, he commended them for receiving the word, not as the words of men, but as the word of the very living God, because that's exactly what it is. So as we open the word of God together today, I pray that your ears will be tuned to hear the very voice of Christ, not in the voice of David, but the voice of Christ as he comes to you through his word. So let's pray to that end for the Holy Spirit to help us to discern the very word of Christ as he is preached. Father, we are grateful that you have made yourself known to men. Father, we confess that we, we are sinful, we are, we are unworthy that you should speak to us in such plain ways, in such redemptive and kind ways, and yet you have done exactly that. You've spoken to us throughout history in various ways, through, through prophets and through ministers and through angels, but now in these final days, you have spoken to us finally, fully, completely in and through your Son. And we give you thanks for him. We pray now for the work of your Spirit in us, to create in us an, an affection for your word, to create in us the, the light that we need to understand your word as it, as, it is, as it is truly revealed to us. And we need the conviction of your Spirit to convince us of the truth of what we hear and to give us the courage, the boldness, and the patience and perseverance to apply these things in our ordinary daily lives. Now, we pray that you will conform your people more and more to the very image of your Son through this, this holy means that you've given to us of the declaration of your word. So we ask all of this under the name and by the authority of Christ, 
For the benefit and blessing of your people, we ask it. Amen. If you turn with me to Judges chapter 3, if you were here for the conference, you know the theme of the weekend has been the new man at home. The new man at home. And in Colossians 3, Paul paints this picture of the new man in Christ, the new creature in Christ. And he turns his camera lens, as it were, to the home. Because this is the first and most uh, effective place where the, the new man's new clothes are displayed. But it's also the place in which the old man is most likely to be tempted to come back. It's exactly in the home where those, the things that characterize the old man, the anger, the covetousness, the sexual immorality, all those kinds of things are more likely to be provoked there where people know us best. Our text today is in Judges chapter 3, and I think you will be persuaded, hopefully you will be persuaded as we go along, that Judges chapter 3, 1 through 6 is, fits very well. It dovetails very nicely with what we've looked at in Colossians 3 over the weekend. Following the Lord's deliverance of his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, he told them through his prophet Moses that he would now bring them into the land, the land that he had promised to their fathers, Abraham and then Isaac and then renewed again through Jacob. And the Lord repeatedly instructed and he warned his people over and over again. He warned them that as they entered the promised land, they would confront enemies, not only in a military sense, but most importantly, in a spiritual sense, they would be confronted by enemies, by adversaries. And the temptations they faced among the Canaanites would be severe. And he commanded his people not to conform themselves to the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. And in the opening chapters of the book of Judges, we find that the non-conformity to which God had called his people, he called them not to conform to the ways of the world, to the, to the Canaanites around them, he, we find that that non-conformity would be nothing less than warfare. It's war. In a very literal, tangible sense, but also in a spiritual sense. And God called his people to holiness. He called them to a strict non-conformity, with the Canaanites, but the sad reality, and, and I think you probably know the story and the various the, the story arc of the book of Judges. It's it's a constant descent as that cycle of of sin and God delivering them into oppression, and then them calling out to the Lord for deliverance, and then God raising up a deliverer to to deliver them. But each time that cycle gets worse and worse and worse. And the overarching theme of Judges is that there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. God had called his people to holiness. He'd called them to strict nonconformity, but they very quickly rejected God's command. Yahweh had called his people to demonstrate faithfulness to him by means of their nonconformity to the world. And he's left enemies in the land to test them. And now, as we come forward into the new covenant, the same trials, the same challenges, the same warfare remains. In fact, I'm convinced the passage that we read this, this morning uh, first, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-12, through 12, I'm convinced that it is the New Covenant parallel passage to Judges 3, 1-6. through 6. As we read these things, I want you to have those in your mind. Those texts go side by side because thematically they're exactly the same issues. God has left enemies in the land to test his people, and the new man in Christ must be prepared to engage himself in nothing short of warfare. Before I tell you the main battlefronts of this warfare, I want to acknowledge in the text, as we read this in a moment, I want you to see there's, there's, a, there's a why question that sort of percolates up. A why question. Why has God left enemies in the land? We're going to see in the text, in Judges 3, 1 through 6, God tells his people, I've left enemies there, and it's on purpose. And we went, why? Why would God do that? And very briefly, Judges 2 tells us that part of the answer is because God said so. God told the people, if you go into the land and you fail to obey me, then I'm not going to drive out all your enemies before you. So part of this is just simple cause and effect. If you obey me, I'll drive the enemies out completely. I will vanquish your foe completely, and you will have complete and utter rest. But they didn't do that. And God said, if you don't, if you conform yourself to them, if you take up their practices, then I will not drive them out before you. So part of the reason, part of the answer to the why question, why are there enemies in the land? Because God said there would be if, you, if they didn't obey. 
But the other part of it is, is significant as well. The text we're going to read, it says that they, God left enemies there to test them, to refine them, to teach them how to engage in warfare against those who would wage war against their souls. Why must there be a war? Why did God leave enemies in the land? He used their enemies actually to train them in holiness. He used enemies to train them in holiness. And that might seem paradoxical to us. That might even seem backwards to us, that God would leave enemies. He would leave adversaries, spiritual adversaries, those who would wage war against us. He leaves them on purpose so that he might perfect us, try us, train us, cause us to grow in holiness. So this morning's sermon I've titled, The New Man at Home and the Warfare of Non-Conformity. So I want to consider now, I mentioned just briefly sort of a, a why question. Why has God left enemies in the land? But, but this morning for the subject of the sermon, I want to address the what question. What is the nature of this battle? What is the nature of the battle that waged war against the souls of the Israelites as they led into the land of Canaan? And what is the present battle that still remains for each of us? What are those three main battlefronts? You know, as, you, as, as historians study wars, if you study World War II, or you study the Civil War, or you study ancient European wars, you will find that there are key and decisive battles. There are key fronts of the battle. And sometimes within one war, the battle's going on in multiple fronts. In, the, in, the, uh, in World War II, for example, you had the German front, the European front, and you had the Pacific front, two primary fields of battle. What are the primary fields of battle in this war that wages continually against our souls? In some ways, I've, this will be the sixth sermon I've preached this weekend, and in some ways this is the easiest sermon to preach. And not because the subject matter is easy, but because I don't think it will be difficult at all to persuade you of the contemporary significance and relevance of this material. I think you will easily see how immediately relevant this is within our own cultural context. Three primary areas of testing. And look for this as we read Judges 3, chapters one, or verses 1 through 6, and particularly in verse 6. Notice these three primary areas of testing, these three battlefronts of the war. True worship of Yahweh is number one. That's the first battlefront. Secondly, marriage and sexuality. Marriage and human sexuality is the second primary field of battle. And thirdly, children and education and discipleship. Children, education and discipleship. Those are the three primary fronts in this battle. Let's read together Judges chapter 3. Hear the word of God together. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars of Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon. From Mount Baal Hermon, as far as Labo Hamath, they were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served other gods. In both the New Testament... In, both of the New, in, in the New Testament, both of the primary apostles that we see in, as, as writers in the New Testament, Peter and, and Paul, both of them warn God's new covenant people about conformity to the world around us. See, this isn't a problem that is related to or relegated to the Old Covenant alone. Under the Old Covenant, God had warned his people about conformity to the world around them. Under the New Covenant, the apostolic witness of the Lord Jesus Christ warns his people about what? Conformity to the world around us. In Romans chapter 12, 
The Apostle Paul, after giving the first 11 chapters of, of laying out the glories of the gospel and all the eternal mysteries of Christ, Paul comes to chapter 12 and he says, Therefore, therefore, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, meaning set apart, and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Listen to what he says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul is not giving to us, to New Testament Christians, this sort of hypothetical situation where he's not, he's not saying to you, saints, guard yourselves, watch yourselves, because if you're not really careful, you might accidentally slip into being conformed by the world. That's not what he's saying. He's saying this is your default position. This is my default position, is conformity to the world. By nature, we are conformed to the world, and it is that renewal of the mind by the transforming work of the Spirit of God through the Word of God that causes us to draw away from this world and the things of it, to be less and less conformed. We start, being, we start by being conformed to the world, and, and by God's grace, we are less and less attached to it. So in Paul's mind, conformity to the world and holiness are at odds with one another. Conformity to the world is our default position. Holiness is the goal. So these are, these are opposite ends of the spectrum. Now Peter, in the text that we had this read for us this morning, Peter draws on some of these very same themes. And, and, he, and he's urging his readers, readers that are sojourners, they're pilgrims, they've been, they've been dispersed from their homes and lands because of persecution against the church. They've been sort of flung from Jerusalem. And Peter's reminding them of things like, well, you have an inheritance that is stored up in heaven that is undefiled and unperishing. And the people of God are going, well, I'm sure glad it's in heaven because I don't have a place to keep it here. I've lost my home. I've lost my family. And into that very context, Peter says, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's exactly what God has told his old covenant people as he prepared to send them across the Jordan River under Joshua's leadership. You're a holy nation. You are my people. Now, the grace of the, of the gospel shows up in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he says, you who knew no mercy became mercy. He's referencing the book of Hosea. You who God called his people at one point because of their stubborn refusal, because of their conformity to the world, he called them, you are no mercy. And after he graciously redeemed them and restored them, he said, now you are called mercy. So Peter says, you are that chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. God didn't make his people a holy, chosen, set-apart people for their own benefit. He said, I've made you this way that, so that, in order that, you may proclaim the excellencies of God Most High. That by your words, by your deeds, you proclaim and testify to those Canaanites, to the Gentiles, the mysteries and the majesty and the glory and the dominion and the redemption of God Most High. Peter goes on, he says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, listen to this, as sojourners, as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. See, he pulls no punches. He says, this is war. This is war. You wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So as we think about what are the, what are the battlefronts of this particular war, we see under the Old Covenant, Paul, God told his people, I'm leaving enemies in the land that will test you. And there's a generation going into the land who doesn't know war. They weren't part of the original wars of the Canaanites. It was a whole new generation that had emerged. Had emerged. And under the New Covenant, we see the very same phenomenon. God has left us here. God has left enemies in the land. If you've been a Christian more than 24 hours, you know the enemy remains in you, doesn't he? You know this. 
You fight it every day. We, we, we will sing songs of praise today and we will leave this place and sin will attack us before we get home. It's true, isn't it? But when we understand that the wars of Israel are in many respects our wars, we look at the battlegrounds that they faced and realize we're still fighting on the same field. We're still fighting the same battle. We're still fighting in, this, in, this, in the battlefront of worship. The battlefront of marriage and sexuality. The battlefront of children and education. And I'm convinced those three remain the same. Now notice something in the text. Paul, he, we, we have some geographical things that you may first think are just simply historical tidbits or something for a, a Bible trivia game. It, it is, that is not the case. When the Lord gives to us these nations that are left behind, we see that the war is described in verse 3. We have the Philistines. If you have a map of Israel, you would see the Philistines are up in the southwest, or down in the southwest. The Sidonians are in the northwest. The Hivites are in the northeast. And the Canaanites in the southeast. All four points of the compass are covered here. Now, why is that? We can look at this and say, well, all four corners of Israel were subjected to this war. All four corners. And that demonstrates that Israel had failed in every place. Israel's failure was comprehensive. It was total. The spiritual and moral canonization of Israel was thorough and exhaustive in its scope. Now, the other thing that we, take, we need to take note of is when it describes the Canaanites, the Canaanites were not a specific nation or even a specific ethnic people. The Canaanites may best be described as, as perhaps a coalition of people found in this particular geographical area that's been, that God had promised to his people. And this coalition of ethnicity shared many similar cultural practices, and especially their idolatry and their sexual immorality. Now, why, why is that important? Why is it important that we understand the Canaanites were not one specific ethnic group, but rather a broad coalition of dangers? It's because if the Canaanites represent the various spiritual dangers facing spiritual Israel in every age, then we have to see it's not just simply one narrowly defined enemy that we can simply avoid. The enemies are everywhere, and they take all forms and all shapes and all sizes. The diversity of evils among the Canaanites points us to the diversity of evil facing every single believer, every single family, every single church, in this present age. The Canaanites point us to that diversity of evil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, your, your church is very similar to, to ours in the sense that we have, we have a number of, of homeschooling families. And, and I've noticed over the years among us homeschooling families, we've homeschooled six kids and are prayerfully hoping to, to be homeschooling our granddaughters in the near future. But there's a temptation that comes. We're, we're tempted sometimes to think as homeschoolers that if we homeschool or we undertake maybe other practices that we can prevent the kind of evils that are out there. And what this text reminds us of is that the enemies are so diverse and so comprehensive that there's no one strategy that's going to deliver us from those enemies. There's no one thing that we can do is, oh, I'll protect my children in such a way that they won't have those kinds of difficulties. They won't, they won't have to fight that war. But don't we forget something theologically that's very important when we do that? With our sons and daughters, Canaan is very much as much in here as it is out there. The Canaanites live within us, not only outside of us. So we can't, I heard uh, Tim Challies one time wrote an article, and I thought he made some, said something very insightful. He said, we cannot protect our children into the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that good? We cannot protect our children into the kingdom of heaven. So let's consider, first of all, these three areas of battle. The first one is worship. The first one is worship. And what, what, what can we learn about the war of nonconformity with respect to worship? There were, there were too many features of, of Canaanite worship were an abomination to the Lord than we could even mention here today. We, we, I would have to dedicate a full sermon just to look at that subject. But it was, it was vast. The evils of Canaanite worship were, were comprehensive. Three things, though, stand out when we think about 
what distinguished the worship that Yahweh's people were commanded to offer to Yahweh versus the stark contrast of the worship of their pagan neighbors. There, was, there were distinct features of pagan worship and key features of what ought to have been the object of Israel's true worship. First of all, Yahweh is a transcendent. It means he's everywhere. He is above his creation. He is not in his creation. He is above his creation. Yahweh is transcendent. He is holy. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He sees all, and he dwells among his peoples wherever they go. The primary god of the, ba- of the, of the Canaanites was the Baal, was Baal and his various consorts. And he was the god of fertility. He was the god of the storm. And, and the way that the Canaanites imagined their god was that he really was just a, a higher form of them. In fact, their fertility rituals required sexual immorality because they were trying to persuade their god, Baal, to consort with his various lovers in order to produce rain and crops and herds and harvests. So their their worship was, was, was very carnal because their God was carnal. Their God was really like them. One of the things, saints, that we can, we can avoid much error in our, in our thinking of God is to think this way. There are, there are qualified ways in which we can say we are like God. By virtue of creation, every man, woman, and child is an image bearer of God. So in that qualified way, we can say every man, every woman, is like God in that narrow sense. As a new creature... In Christ, you can say you are like God and becoming more like God as you are conformed more and more to the very image of his son. And one day, the promise for the believer is that we will be raised, our bodies will be transformed, we will be glorified, and we will have a body like our saviors. So there are narrow, qualified ways we can say we are like God. But we may never, ever, never, never, ever, never say that God is like us. And any time you see somebody saying, God is like us in this way, God's emotions are like ours, or God's, God's anger is like ours, or God's actions are like ours, we have to reject that, be very suspicious of it. God is not like us. But the Baals, or the, the Canaanites had worshipped Baal as a God really like them. Two, Yahweh is a God who speaks. Yahweh is a God who speaks, and God's people were to expect Yahweh to speak to them. They had his word. What nation of all the earth was given the oracles of God except Israel? They had the word of God, and they should have heard that word. They should have followed that word. And and in contrast, the worship of the Canaanites, they worshiped a God who could not speak, who could not hear. You remember Elijah and the 500 prophets of Baal, and Elijah's taunting them. Where's your God? I mean, is he asleep? Has he gone on a journey? Is he stepped aside to relieve himself. Where is your God? He says nothing. He speaks nothing. He can do nothing. Yahweh is a God who speaks. God, Yahweh is a God who acts. But thirdly, there's a significant distinction in the worship between Israel and, and the, 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 the people of Canaan. The worship was supposed to center around Yahweh and what he requires. Worship ought to have centered around Yahweh and what he required, but instead... The Canaanites, their worship was all about the desires of the worshiper. Curtailing to the desires and the whims and the affections of the worshiper rather than what Yahweh wanted. The Canaanites conceived of their gods really as little more than powerful versions of themselves. One archaeological biblical handbook says this, there is no indication that the Canaanite gods handed down a moral code for their people to follow. Indeed, the Canaanites were apparently much more moral than were their gods. An observation that is not especially flattering to the gods. To the Canaanite, fertility was of major importance in worship, and both male and female temple prostitution was prevalent. There is, there is a, a maxim that is certainly true. You become what you worship. You become like what you worship. That's a statement that's universally true in every age and every place throughout human history. You become what you worship. You become like what you worship. And rather than offering exclusive 
worship to Yahweh, Yahweh who is their holy and transcendent God, the people began to blend their worship. They would still worship Yahweh, but then they would also worship Baal. And they would worship among the Canaanites and worship this God of Baal. And it's, on one hand, we can be very critical of the Israelites and think about, well, I wouldn't have done that. I would not. I certainly would have done. No, you wouldn't. There was a seduction to the Canaanite worship. If you were coming in and you're trying to, you've driven out the enemies, you're trying to set up your own cities and establish your own herds, and here's the lure of the Canaanite neighbor who says, why don't you come down to the temple with me? Why don't you get your son and come down to the temple? If you observe this ritual prostitution, your herds will magnify, your fields will grow, the rain will come at the appropriate time. This is what our God does. This is his specialty, is giving you the prosperity you desire. And Yahweh said, no, worship of me is costly. You take the best from your herd. You cut its neck and you bring it to me. You devote your firstborn to me. You give a tenth of your produce to me. The Canaanite gods didn't demand. We would just offer you stuff. We don't demand anything of you. So rather than offering this exclusive worship, they sought to blend it. And now, slowly but surely, the people began to reflect the character of the God they worshipped. Rather than reflecting the holiness of Yahweh, they began to reflect the fleshliness, the carnality of the false God of Baal that they worshipped. See, we, we began to be like what we worship each and every time. The Canaanites had innumerable ways of seeking the will of their gods. So the people began to, to take on this idea of, oh, we have a, Yahweh is a God who speaks. He's given us his word. He's given us prophets. And the people of God said, yeah, but there are special circumstances, particularly maybe in war or with respect to our harvest. We want a different word from God. We want an extra word of God. We want, we want something more than what God has already said to us. And they began to imitate the Canaanites. And the Canaanites had all kinds of ways of divining and trying to discern the will of their gods. The Canaanites would, would examine the entrails of birds and animals for omens. They would consult the dead and apparently even sacrifice their own children as a means of trying to discern what is the will of God. And God had said, I've already spoken to you. I've given you my will. I didn't stutter. I gave it to you. It's plain. But Canaanite worship was self-indulgent. It was fleshly, it was carnal, and it perfectly reflected their view of their gods. Yahweh had called his people to something different, but they rejected that. True worship of Yahweh, it edifies, it builds up, it establishes. True worship of Yahweh is a means of drawing near to him, but instead they traded that for the worship of beasts and idols, and they became more and more like those idols instead of more and more like Yahweh. One commentator puts it this way. He says, Canaanite worship was socially destructive. Its religious acts were pornographic and sick, seriously damaging to children, creating early impressions of deities with no interest in moral behavior. It tried to dignify, by the use of religious labels, depraved acts of bestiality and corruption. It had a low estimate of human life. It suggested that anything was permissible promiscuity, murder, anything else in order to guarantee a good crop at harvest. It ignored the highest values both in the family and in the wider faith community. Love, loyalty, purity, peace, and security. And encouraged the view that all these things were inferior to material prosperity, physical satisfaction, and human pleasure. A society where those things matter most is self-destructive. Again, do I need to convince you of the contemporary relevance of this? Will you take my word for this? This kind of worship encouraged material prosperity, physical satisfaction, and human pleasure. Now, I would submit to you that is rampant today, even under the name of Christ. Where entire churches, entire ministries are feeding into the lusts of human beings appealing to their sense of material prosperity. Name it and claim it. Health and wealth, all this will be given to you if you just have faith. It appeals to the physical satisfactions and to human pleasures. And again, I don't think I have to persuade you that that is true. The will of God is now sought in, in many evangelical spheres in, in many other ways other than the word of God. 
The, the will of God is sought through impressions or visions or secret messages from God or, or from one's own you know, gut and intuition rather than the infallible, sufficient word of God. Worship is often carnal. It appeals to the flesh. It seeks to make men happy rather than honoring God. Material prosperity and, and physical pleasure drive even the forms of worship. Even the forms of worship. But don't we have to be honest with ourselves here? Don't we want those same things? Don't we want material prosperity? Don't we want physical pleasure? Don't we want comfort and ease and even worship that's tailored to us? You see, we're not very different than the Israelites of old, are we? And God called his people back to him, to holiness. There, there is a reason why some of the churches around us are filled. Their parking lots are filled. Their big, ginormous buildings are filled with people who want their ears tickled, who want them to be promised material prosperity, who want to be promised physical satisfaction, who want to worship God on their own terms. We want sometimes the programs and entertainment. And, and we, you have to ask yourself, are you seeing church primarily as the place to worship your risen king or primarily as a place to get your social needs met? Are you seeing the church as the place of you serving and giving yourself and dying to yourself and living for the, for, on behalf of God and his people? Or is church a place where you're promoting your business, your material prosperity, your place in a community? Fundamentally, do you think of worship as warfare? Do you think of the, of the act of going to worship, the, the act of, of submitting yourself to the ordinances of Christ, being with his people on the Lord's day as an act of war? Do you see it that way? It is. It is nothing less than, a, than an act of war. And sometimes we see that in very, very ordinary ways. The, the, the devil steals socks on Sunday morning, doesn't he? Shoes. Belts, your son's pants that fit last week don't fit this week. I mean, we see that in those, it seems as if all, all hell is against us even to get to church on a Sunday morning sometimes. But it's far more significant than that. Is anyone who has ever said to their employer, I will not work on the Lord's day, they know that's an act of war. You know it. It's a declaration of war. You know, if you tell the sports team that your child loves dearly, we will not play in a tournament that's on the Lord's Day. That's an act of war, isn't it? We will not be at the 4-H event that, that takes place on a Sunday. That's an act of war. See, these things wage war against our souls. Will we commit ourselves to the ordinances of Christ as he's given to us, as he's commanded us to do? Or it, it may be a family birthday party. A family reunion, where it feels like an act of war to say, I'm sorry, we would love to be there, but we won't come on a Sunday. If it's not a Friday night, a Saturday, we will make every effort to be there, but we won't come on the Lord's Day. We are commanded to gather with God's people and worship Yahweh on that day. That is his day, not ours. And perhaps we need to think more carefully about how easily and, and, and subtly we are being conformed to the patterns of the world around us, the patterns and forms of pagan worship. Sometimes it even goes under the banner of Christ. And, and sometimes either as a function of our own naivete or our neglect, we put ourselves, our families, and our churches in great peril. If, if we don't grasp that the competing objects and forms of worship all around us are at warfare with our souls, this area of worship remains an active hot zone. <laughs> this is an active battle for the people of God. But it's not only worship. We see this also, particularly in verse 6. Look what happens in verse 6. We see this in the area of marriage and sexuality. And their daughters they took to themselves. Just one little verse, but it comes in with, with all of the subtlety of a sledgehammer. That their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons. Now, you have to go back and, and, and read through Deuteronomy, for example, a series of sermons that Moses preached as, as he was preparing God's people to go in across the Jordan. And over and over and over and over again, God said, do not 
give your sons. Do not take their daughters for your sons and do not give your daughters to them in marriage. Marriage and human sexuality was a key battlefront. And by God's command, Israel was to be completely and wholly different from the pagan nations who occupied the lands. The sexual ethic, the sexual morality of the Canaanites was wholly different than what God had given to his own people. Again, he called them to be holy, set apart, a chosen people, a holy nation. By God's design, the area of marriage and sexuality should have been, should have been one of the most striking differences. As they crossed the Jordan, as they set up their cities, and as they, they established their homes and their, their worship of Yahweh, the most striking difference to their, cult, to their pagan neighbors should have been their marriages. The way they viewed human sexuality. But sadly, it wasn't. And unless you've been living under a rock, you know this remains one of the most heated battlefronts in our lives today, doesn't it? The area of human sexuality, the area of marriage. John Gill made this observation. He says, the Israelites intermarried with the inhabitants of the land, contrary to the express command of God, whereby they confounded their families, debased their blood, and were ensnared into idolatry. I, I wouldn't have to, I could start on the front row and go back with a pole and I wouldn't get very far before you were testifying to me about how you know families just like this. You know dear, dear friends, family members. Perhaps in your own history you've, you've experienced this where you've confounded your family, debased your blood and ensnared yourself into idolatry because of a, of a bad marriage, an unlawful marriage. God commanded his people to tear down the altars of the people around them. As they went into these new territories, they were to tear down those altars, and he forbade them cutting covenants with the inhabitants of the land. They were not to make any covenant in any way with the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. But I believe that the Israelites missed an important corollary to that command. God said, don't cut covenants with them. But there was also another command that went right alongside that one. Listen to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, beginning in verse 13. But rather you are to tear down their altars and shatter their sacrifice, their sacred pillars, and cut down their ashram, for you shall worship, you shall not worship any other god, for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you cut a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invite you to eat of his sacrifice. And, listen to this, and you take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. You shall make for yourself no molten gods. You see what's happening here? Through the Spirit of God, Moses is making a direct connection between marrying a pagan and worshiping that pagan's gods. We, we can't sever that, unsever that. There is a direct correlation between marriage to an idolater, marriage to an unbeliever, and their own pattern of worship. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, Furthermore, says Moses, You shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me, and they will serve other gods. Then the anger of Yahweh will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. Now I have to imagine, there were, there were some Israelites who thought, well, I know God said this, but they reasoned this way. But it won't be this, it'll be different with my son. My son will be different. He will be able to marry the pagan, the pagan young woman down the street so that she or her father and my father now can share this field and we can come to an agreement. It will be mutually satisfying for all of us and I'll watch over it. I'll make sure he, he's not going to be led astray. See, don't we think that way too? Don't we think of the commands of God? I, I know God said that, but I know why he said it. He was concerned about idolatry. I won't participate in the idolatry. We overestimate ourselves. We think far too highly of ourselves. And later on in the book of Judges, this becomes obvious with perhaps the most famous of the judges, Samson. Strongest man that ever lived. What was his main weakness? A pagan woman. Tragically, God was right. Marriage to unbelievers turned away the hearts of God's people, and it will do it every time. God says this is going to happen. 
Oh, it won't happen to me. Yes, it will. Absolutely it will. And tragically, you can go to read in 1 Kings 11 about Solomon, how about his, his love for his many foreign wives turned his heart away from the Lord, the strongest man who ever lived and the wisest man who ever lived. But you think you'll be different. You think you're the exception? The people of Israel perverted the very institution of marriage. When they, when they entered, when they intermarried with their pagan neighbors, not only did it lead to idolatry and false worship, which the Lord said was going to happen, but it also undermined the very purposes of marriage. We talked about this Friday night. From the very beginning, God intended marriage for his glory, the good, good of his people, and a means of preserving a distinct people, a holy people for himself, a distinct culture of Yahweh worshipers. But instead, the Israelites used marriage of their sons and daughters to advance their own agendas, not God's. To appeal to their own desires, not Yahweh's revealed will. They wanted to make, through their, through their marriages, they wanted to make themselves more favorable in the sight of the world. And they gave little thought to the spiritual consequences of such reshaping of their priorities. God said, do not cut a covenant with the Canaanites and do not intermarry with them. And the, and the Israelites somehow found a way to kill two birds with one stone. We'll violate God's law twofold at one time. He says, don't cut a covenant, don't intermarry. We'll cut a covenant by intermarrying. How's that? Now notice here, notice something very important. It was the parents who were charged not to give their daughters or take their sons. It was the parents who were charged. There was a parental responsibility with respect to the marriage of their children, and that hasn't changed. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. We talked about this over the weekend. It is, it is this, the young man and young woman who, who are desired to be married who, who are the ones who must give their own mutual consent. But parents, don't neglect our responsibility. Don't neglect the responsibility that we have as parents to shape our children and, and, and help to bend them in the ways of God. Parents, if we wait until our children become interested in the opposite sex, if we think we're going to wait until they become of marrying age to begin to instruct them about what God-honoring marriage is, we've waited too long. We need to be instructing them early and often. And further, there's a very worldly idea that, that, that we leave our children to their own desires and their own wishes when they select a marriage partner. It's a very worldly idea. And again, I'm not advocating for a particular template. I'm not advocating for a form of dating or courtship. or that, that, that misses the point. The scriptures don't give us a template, but the word of God does warn. Both the old covenant and the new covenant warns us in strong terms. It warns both parents and children about the dangers they face by being unequally yoked. The mortal dangers. The dangers to their souls. We're not talking about just having an unpleasant marriage on earth. We're talking about your soul being in jeopardy. And in this common kingdom in which we live, there simply is nothing more that will influence the next generation, either for good or evil, than the choice of a spouse. It's a very important decision. Samson's parents pleaded with him regarding his desire to marry a Philistine woman. He says, Judge, uh, Samson's father said, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Take her for me. She is right in my eyes. See, Samson's affections had not been shaped by his parents. His desires had not been shaped. Parents, don't underestimate our ability and, and our duty to shape what your sons and daughters find attractive in a spouse. I mean, from very early ages, we're, we're shaping their affections in other ways. We train them what they like to eat, either badly or well. We train them. If we're causing them, even as little guys, little girls, to learn to eat broccoli, to learn to eat these other things, they will grow up learning to eat those. If we just leave them to their own desires, Twinkies and chocolate and milk will be on the menu for the rest of their lives. But we have the ability to shape their affections. We can shape their affection in, in all kinds of things. I look back on it in my own household. Even, even the music I listen to, the movies I watch, those things, my parents shaped my affections in those things, even to this very day. There are things that I prefer not to watch simply because it was something my parents preferred not to watch. 
we have a great capacity as parents to shape the appetites of our children for food, entertainment, music, other things. Why would we not use those same powers of influence to shape the most important, some of the most important earthly decisions they will make? And, and you know, we, we spend a lot of energy, and I think for good reason, telling our sons, for example, what not to look at. Son, guard your eyes. Don't look at that. And that, that's good. We should do that. But do we go the other way? What should they look at then? Do we shape the affections of, our, of our, even our younger boys and say, you see how that young woman is caring for those children? Do you see how, how respectfully she speaks to her parents? Son, that's the kind of woman you want. Do you see the way she eagerly serves and, and helps in her church family? Do you see how kind she is? That's the kind of woman you want. Do we tell our daughters? Do you see how hardworking that young man is? Do you see how he speaks to his mother? How gently and respectfully he speaks to her? How, how eager he is to put his hands to work here in the church or in his community? That's the kind of young man you want to find. See, we can shape that. It's not even difficult if we will take the time to do it. We ought to start early and often shaping those affections within our sons and daughters. Parents, do you see holiness and faithfulness in your own marriages as an act of war? Sometimes we, we, we get caught up in just the daily grind of life. And our marriages just seem really very common, maybe even weak. Remember, the Apostle Paul teaches us that these very weak things in the sight of the world are actually the strength of God. These very things that are the despised of the world are exactly the same things that God uses to tear down strongholds. Can you imagine? And I don't think you have to be a prophet to, to, to sort of look forward into our culture. If you've seen the, the, how rapidly we've seen sexual morals decline in a generation. I mean, who would have anticipated even 20 years ago the, the kinds of things we would be dealing with now as a culture? And, and the, 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 the darkness that seems to be pressing upon us in this issue of marriage and sexuality. And, and if, we, if that trend continues and we look out another 10 years or 20 years, I shudder to think of where we will be. But with that comes a wonderful opportunity. Catch a vision and help to shape your children to catch this vision of what an ordinary, well-ordered Christian home, with all of its imperfections, what kind of testimony that can be to a world that's just gone mad. See, that's what God intended. As his people went in to the land of Canaan, your marriages, the way you order your home, the way the new man in Christ functions in an ordinary way in his home, the way he's able to open his home to, to give hospitality to an unbelieving neighbor, the way you're able to open your home and serve and give, give aid and comfort to a church member who's in distress, the way you're able to take to, to even open your home to the homosexual couple who lives three doors down and expose them to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to, a, to the way that God has intended a home to be ordered. It's kind of like going to the jewelry store. I have two, two children that married in 2020, and as a son and son-in-law, we're going through the process of picking out an engagement ring. You go to the jeweler, and they pull that out, and they always put it on a piece of black velvet. Because the jeweler knows that diamond's really going to shine the brightest against a black backdrop. How much more can your, can your homes, even with all your weaknesses, your imperfections, but ordered by the grace of God under the authority of Christ, how much will that shine like a bright diamond in the darkness of our culture? And that's exactly what was happening in the first century. When, when the Christian sexual ethic took, began to take hold in the Roman Empire, and people were rejecting the, the pagan spirituality and, and the, the sexuality of worship, the sensuality, they rejected that. And they began to, to love their own wives, love their husbands, love their children, raise their families to the glory of God. God transformed a whole culture in that way. Let's not despise those little things. Let's not despise those ordinary things. Let's look in the last place, the, other, the final battlefront, and you probably can anticipate this. It's implicit. The other two are explicit in, in Judges chapter 3 with respect to marriage and idolatry. But here, it's implicit in the areas of children and education. 
This is an ongoing field of warfare. And as parents, you probably feel this. I know we do. Where you feel like you can't even go to a public place without feeling like your children are being assaulted from every angle. Maybe not physically, but their eyes, their ears, their affections. They're being assaulted from every direction, aren't they? And see, we can't shelter them enough to prevent that. Because the other thing that comes from within them, it's the world, the devil, and their own flesh that is assaulting them. The third primary front in this spiritual warfare in the land of Canaan, the, 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 the final most important battlefront for the new man and his home is in this area of education and discipleship of children. If we are truly engaged in the warfare of worship and marriage, if we're bringing our children along in those discussions, as we're walking as tour guides with our children, see, son, on your, on your, on your right is sin and folly with respect to marriage, with respect to worship. On the other hand, this is the path of righteousness. If we're walking along beside them, that's the command of Deuteronomy. As you get up in the morning, as you walk along the way, as you lay down at night, speak of these things to your children. Parents, you see yourselves as, as a holy tour guide. We're not so much sheltering your children from every evil of the world, but pointing out this is the cause. Sinful men and their sinful hearts have committed sinful deeds, but here's the effect. Look at the damage. Look at the folly. Look at the fallout from all that they've done. Rather than sheltering your sons and daughters from that, say, with, with, in an age-appropriate way, say, I want you to see the effect of this. Son, don't go down that path. Isn't that what Solomon's doing over and over and over again in the book of Proverbs? Son, observe. Even look at the ant. The ant is, is busy. He's working hard. He's preparing. Son, that's what you want to imitate. Solomon looks at the natural world around him. He also goes and says, think about the adulterous woman. Look at all the preparations she's made to lure you in. Son, don't go there. Don't even walk by her house. Don't think to yourself, oh, I can walk by. I won't be tempted. Don't even go. Are we shaping our children in that way? If we're walking along with them on these areas of marriage, these areas of worship, then we're participating already in their training and their education. Now, I want to hasten to add, this is not about a particular mode of education. The Bible doesn't command a particular mode. It doesn't command homeschooling or private schooling or government schools. That's, that's beside the point. In fact, regardless of what mode you choose, with which to educate your children, there are warnings you must heed. The real warning is the canonization of their hearts and minds. And there must be a sober reality, whether you homeschool or whether your kids are in the public school. You will have a particular set of temptations with which you will have to deal as a parent, and you are responsible before the Lord to guard against those temptations. And, and, and a sober mind is necessary to say, well, if I homeschool my kids, here's the particular set of challenges I will have with respect to the canonization of their hearts and minds. How do I guard against that? How do I, how do I disciple them through this? How do I train them and teach them and instruct them in our context? If they're down the road at the, at the, at the public school, the same warnings, the same temptations. What, what particular temptations will these children face? What is waging war against their minds, their hearts? And am I willing to do the work that's required of God, by God, of me, for the preservation of their souls? Now, in chapter 2 of Judges, it describes a generation that came after Joshua. And the sad, tragic statement is there arose a generation who did not know Yahweh. We see this in verse 10 of chapter 2. You, in your Bible, it's probably just across the fold on the page. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, meaning the, the, the generation that had crossed the Jordan. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Is there a sadder statement? Is, is there a more tragic statement that the children of God's people would not know him and his works? May it never be. It may never be said among this, the, the, the children of PBC that, that they don't know Yahweh or his works. We see this same kind of thing again in Nehemiah chapter 13. After 70 years of captivity in Babylon, Nehemiah makes this observation. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon and Moab, and half their children spoke the language of Ashdod. 
and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. Now let's bring that forward into a contemporary context. May it never be that your children can quote song lyrics and sports statistics and pop cultural references and even, even profitable things in the arts and sciences, but they know not Yahweh and his word. They don't know the things of God. They know all the things of this world. They're worldly wise, and that can be helpful to a degree, but they don't know the things of God. I mean, to paraphrase our Lord, what will it profit your son if he gains the best career in the world but forfeits his own soul? What will it profit your daughter if she reaches the heights of academic achievement but robs her soul of love for God and for his people? There's a war waging against your sons and your daughters. Even secular thinkers today are beginning to understand this and take notice of this. And they're seeing what the enemies of God have known for hundreds of years. If you capture the hearts and minds of children in schools, you can defeat a whole nation. I heard an interview. It's an older interview. It actually goes back to 1984. It's a former KGB defector, Yuri Bezmanov. This is what he says. According to my opinion... And opinions of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on actual espionage and such. The other 85% is a slow process, which we call either ideological subversion or, quote, active measures. Our psychological warfare, or psychological warfare, what it basically means is this. To change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information so one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their family, or their community, or their country. So basically, two very simple answers. Maybe two simplistic answers or solutions, but nevertheless, they are the only solutions. Again, this is from a former KGB director, a defector, and he says this. These are the two solutions. Number one, educate yourself. Inform yourself about what's actually going on. And praise be to God, Yahweh has done this for us. He has given us his word. He's told us this is the way the world works. This is the way your own heart is tempted. And number two, Yuri Bezmanov says, understand what's going on around you. You are not living at a time of peace. You are in a state of war, and you have precious little time to save yourself. You don't have much time, especially if you're talking about the younger generation. There's not much time left for convulsions to the beautiful disco music. Very soon, it will just... It will go just overnight. Even the pagans know this. And they're playing the long game. Now I can promise you this. Satan and his demons are far more strategic and far more nefarious than anything the Soviets ever conceived. They are far more organized, far more wicked than anything a, a civil enemy has ever conceived of. You are not living at a time of peace, saints. That time of peace is coming. With certainty, it's coming. One day, we will, we will, we will sing together with, with every nation and tongue and tribe and people. If you are in Christ, you will rejoice before the very face of God, having all of your sins cleansed, having all of your unrighteousness purged from you, and having the full measure of Christ's holiness and perfection up to the, his glorification given to you, and you will stand in the presence of God without even, without even the, the, the possibility of you being tempted to sin. What a glorious day that will be. What a day of rest that will be. A day of celebration, a day of rejoicing, but we're not there yet. We're still at arms. We're still at war. And may I, may I persuade you, both under the old covenant and under the new, that those three primary battlefronts remain. Worship. Saints, will you give yourself, give your hearts, your minds, your strength, and encourage all of your household to do likewise, to give yourself to the worship of God. There is no greater battlefront than that. And we have to recognize the enemies that wage war against us in this area are subtle. It's just one baseball game. It's just one family reunion. It's just one other activity. 
And and slowly but surely, our hearts are turned away from Yahweh. Our affections are reshaped. And yet, if we will believe God's word and submit ourselves to his ordinances and believe that he actually uses these means to strengthen us, to edify us, to encourage us, to build us up in the truth. The second front of the battle is marriage, human sexuality. And again, this is the easiest part of of the sermons I've preached this, this weekend. I don't have to persuade you that. You know it's true. Just look out the front door. You'll see it. The battlefront of marriage, the battlefront of sexuality. And we, we, can, we can so easily despise the ordinary things that God has given to us and think these, these weapons are so, so small, but in the hands of a mighty God will tear down strongholds. God may use these things. God may use your ordinary, simple obedience to order your homes according to his word, to transform your whole neighborhood, to transform your extended family. And, and many of you are like me. You don't come from a pattern of, of faithful homes and faithful Christians. But as much as it depends on you today, covenant with the Lord to serve him. And pray that, that for the next three and four and hundred generations to come, if the Lord tarries, we'll walk faithfully with the Lord. And lastly, the hearts and minds of our children, the education, the discipleship of our children is a battlefront. We, we first of all, recognize that. And, and not just, just go through the motions and passively go through this world thinking, it doesn't, you know, it'll all work itself out. No. God has given you commands as parents. Are you instructing them in the things of God? As a parent, are you, are you prioritizing, making sure your children are here under the means of grace, gathered with God's people, able to see the examples of other saints, able to hear the prophetic voice of Christ week by week by week? Are you opening the scriptures around your dinner table and in your living room regularly so that your children will hear the things of God? They will hear the voices of their parents calling out in prayer. They will see the, the holiness of God in, on display in the ordinary rhythms of their home life. This is educating your children. One way or another, you're training your children. It's a matter of you're training them in righteousness or you're training them in unrighteousness. Everything you do is training, whether you're conscious of it or not. Will you submit yourself to these things? Will you trust that the Lord will use these very ordinary things to accomplish his extraordinary good and, and, and wise purposes in us? Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful that that your mercy endures forever. Oh God, we we confess that we have so far missed the mark. We have so fallen short in all of these areas. Will you be merciful to your people? Will you be merciful to grant us the grace of repentance wherever we need it in the areas of our homes, the areas of our our, our sexuality, in the areas of our children and their discipleship, and and most importantly, in the areas of our worship of you and our, our failure to worship you as you have described the worship to us in your word. Lord, I pray for any who are here this morning, even the children among us who know not Christ yet, who have not yet turned from sin, who have not given themselves to Christ fully by by faith alone, who have not come and and exercised the simple obedience of faith to believe that that Christ has died and that you have raised him again according to the scriptures in order that their sins might be forgiven. Oh God, we pray, Holy Spirit, will you work today in the lives of men and women and children to bring new life where hearts are yet dead in sin? Will you move in such a way as to to make chains fall off of hearts that are imprisoned to the sins of the flesh and sins of the heart? Lord, we praise you, we worship you for all of your goodness and all of your wisdom and mercy and kindness towards us and for all of your mighty works in history and redemption. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen.